Chapter six of Far from the Madding Crowd. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tig Hines. Far from the Madding Crowd by Thomas Hardy. Chapter six. The Fair, the Journey, the Fire. Two months passed away. We are brought on to a day in February on which is held the yearly statute or hiring fair in the county town of Casterbridge. At one end of the street stood from two to three hundred blithe and hearty labourers waiting upon chance, all men of the stamp to whom labour suggests nothing worse than a wrestle with gravitation, and pleasure nothing better than a renunciation of the same. Among these, carters and wagoners were distinguished by having a piece of whipcord twisted round their hats. Thatchers wore a fragment of woven straw, shepherds held their sheep-crooks in their hands, and thus the situation required was known to the hirers at a glance. In the crowd was an athletic young fellow of somewhat superior appearance to the rest. In fact, his superiority was marked enough to lead several ruddy peasants standing by to speak to him inquiringly, as to a farmer, and to use sir as a finishing word. His answer always was, "'I am looking for a place myself, a bailiff's. Do you know of anybody who wants one?" Gabriel was paler now, his eyes were more meditative, and his expression was more sad. He had passed through an ordeal of wretchedness which had given him more than it had taken away. He had sunk from his modest elevation as pastoral king into the very slime-pits of Siddim. But there was left to him a dignified calm he had never before known, and that indifference to fate which, though it often makes a villain of a man, is the basis of his sublimity when it does not, and thus the abasement had been exaltation, and the loss gain. In the morning a regiment of cavalry had left the town, and a sergeant and his party had been beating up for recruits through the four streets. As the end of the day drew on, and he found himself not hired, Gabriel almost wished that he had joined them, and gone off to serve his country. Weary of standing in the market-place, and not much minding the kind of work he turned his hand to, he decided to offer himself in some other capacity than that of bailiff. All the farmers seemed to be wanting shepherds. Sheep-tending was Gabriel's speciality. Turning down an obscure street and entering an obscurer lane, he went up to a smith's shop. "'How long would it take you to make a shepherd's crook?' Twenty minutes.' "'How much?' Two shillings.' He sat on a bench, and the crook was made, a stem being given him into the bargain. He then went to a ready-made clothes shop, the owner of which had a large rural connection. As the crook had absorbed most of Gabriel's money, he attempted, and carried out, an exchange of his overcoat for a shepherd's regulation smock-frock. This transaction having been completed, he again hurried off to the centre of the town, and stood on the curb of the pavement as a shepherd, crook in hand. Now that Oak had turned himself into a shepherd, it seemed that bailiffs were most in demand. However, two or three farmers noticed him and drew near. Dialogues followed, more or less in the subjoined form. "'Where do you come from?' "'Norcombe.' "'That's a long way.' Fifteen miles.' "'Whose farm were you upon last?' "'My own.' This reply invariably operated like a rumour of cholera. The inquiring farmer would edge away and shake his head dubiously. Gabriel, like his dog, was too good to be trustworthy, and he never made advance beyond this point. It is safer to accept any chance that offers itself, and extemporize a procedure to fit it, than to get a good plan matured and wait for a chance of using it. Gabriel wished he had not nailed up his colours as a shepherd, but had laid himself out for anything in the whole cycle of labour that was required in the fair. It grew dusk. Some merry men were whistling and singing by the corn exchange. Gabriel's hand, which had lain for some time idle in his smock-frock pocket, touched his flute which he carried there. Here was an opportunity for putting his dearly bought wisdom into practice. He drew out his flute and began to play jockey to the fair, in the style of a man who had never known a moment's sorrow. Oak could pipe with Arcadian sweetness, and the sound of the well-known notes cheered his own heart as well as those of the loungers. He played on with spirit, and in half an hour had earned in pence what was a small fortune to a destitute man. By making inquiries he learnt that there was another fair at Shotsford the next day. "'How far is Shotsford?' Ten miles t'other side of Weatherbury.' 
Weatherbury. It was where Bathsheba had gone two months before. This information was like coming from night into noon. How far is it to Weatherbury? Five or six miles. Bathsheba had probably left Weatherbury long before this time, but the place had enough interest attaching to it to lead Oak to choose Shotsford Fair as his next field of inquiry, because it lay in the Weatherbury quarter. Moreover, the Weatherbury folk were by no means uninteresting intrinsically. If report spoke truly, they were as hardy, merry, thriving, wicked a set as any in the whole county. Oak resolved to sleep at Weatherbury that night on his way to Shotsford, and struck out at once into the high road which had been recommended as the direct route to the village in question. The road stretched through water meadows traversed by little brooks, whose quivering surfaces were braided along their centres, and folded into creases at the sides, or, where the flow was more rapid, the stream was pied with spots of white froth, which rowed on in undisturbed serenity. On the higher levels the dead and dry carcasses of leaves tapped the ground as they bowled along helter-skelter upon the shoulders of the wind, and little birds in the hedges were rustling their feathers and tucking themselves in comfortably for the night, retaining their places if Oak kept moving, but flying away if he stopped to look at them. He passed by Yalbury Wood, where the game-birds were rising to their roosts, and heard the crack-voiced cock-pheasant, kyuk kyuk and the wheezy whistles of the hens. By the time he had walked three or four miles, every shape in the landscape had assumed a uniform hue of blackness. He descended Yalbury Hill, and could just discern ahead of him a wagon, drawn up under a great overhanging tree by the roadside. On coming close he found there were no horses attached to it, the spot being apparently quite deserted. The wagon, from its position, seemed to have been left there for the night, for beyond about half a truss of hay which was heaped in the bottom it was quite empty. Gabriel sat down on the shafts of the vehicle and considered his position. He calculated that he had walked a very fair proportion of the journey, and having been on foot since daybreak he felt tempted to lie down upon the hay in the wagon, instead of pushing on to the village of Weatherbury and having to pay for a lodging. Eating his last slices of bread and ham, and drinking from the bottle of cider he had taken the precaution to bring with him, he got into the lonely wagon. Here he spread half of the hay as a bed, and, as well as he could in the darkness, pulled the other half over him by way of bedclothes, covering himself entirely, and feeling physically as comfortable as ever he had been in his life. Inward melancholy it was impossible for a man like Oak, introspective far beyond his neighbours, to banish quite whilst conning the present untoward page of his history. So, thinking of his misfortunes, amorous and pastoral, he fell asleep, shepherds enjoying, in common with sailors, the privilege of being able to summon the god, instead of having to wait for him. On somewhat suddenly awaking, after a sleep of whose length he had no idea, Oak found that the wagon was in motion. He was being carried along the road at a rate rather considerable for a vehicle without springs, and under circumstances of physical uneasiness, his head being dandled up and down on the bed of the wagon like a kettle-drum stick. He then distinguished voices in conversation, coming from the fore part of the wagon. His concern at his dilemma, which would have been alarm had he been a thriving man, but misfortune is a fine opiate to personal terror, led him to peer cautiously from the hay and the first sight he beheld was the stars above him. Charles's wain was getting towards a right angle with the pole star, and Gabriel concluded that it must be about nine o'clock, in other words, that he had slept two hours. This small astronomical calculation was made without any positive effort, and whilst he was stealthily turning to discover, if possible, into whose hands he had fallen. Two figures were dimly visible in front, sitting with their legs outside the wagon, one of whom was driving. Gabriel soon found that this was the wagoner, and it appeared that they had come from Casterbridge Fair like himself. A conversation was in progress, which continued thus. "'Be as twill, she's a fine handsome body as far as looks be concerned. But that's only the skin of the woman, and these dandy cattle be as proud as Lucifer in their insides.' "'Ay, so it do seem, Bill Smallbury, so it do seem.' This utterance was very shaky by nature, and more so by circumstance, the jolting of the wagon not being without its effect upon the speaker's larynx. It came from the man who held the reins. "'She's a very vain female, so tis said here and there.' "'Ah, now, 
If so be tis like that, I can't look her in the face. Lord, no, not I. <laughs> Such a shy man as I be. Yes, she's very vain. Tis said that every night at going to bed, she looks in the glass to put on her nightcap properly. And not a married woman, all the world. And I can play the piano, so tis said. Can play so clever that I can make a psalm tune sound as well as the merriest loose song a man can wish for. Do you tell it? A happy time for us, and I feel quite a new man. And how do she pay? Oh, that I don't know, Master Poorgrass. On hearing these and other similar remarks, a wild thought flashed into Gabriel's mind that they might be speaking of Bathsheba. There were, however, no grounds for retaining such a supposition, for the wagon, though going in the direction of Weatherbury, might be going beyond it, and the woman alluded to seemed to be the mistress of some estate. They were now apparently close upon Weatherbury, and not to alarm the speakers unnecessarily, Gabriel slipped out of the wagon unseen. He turned to an opening in the hedge, which he found to be a gate, and, mounting thereon, he sat meditating whether to seek a cheap lodging in the village, or to insure a cheaper one by lying under some hay or corn-stack. The crunching jangle of the wagon died upon his ear. He was about to walk on when he noticed on his left hand an unusual light, appearing about half a mile distant. Oak watched it, and the glow increased. Something was on fire. Gabriel again mounted the gate, and, leaping down on the other side upon what he found to be ploughed soil, made across the field in the exact direction of the fire. The blaze, enlarging in a double ratio by his approach and its own increase, showed him, as he drew nearer, the outline of ricks beside it, lighted up to great distinctness. A rickyard was the source of the fire. His weary face now began to be painted over with a rich orange glow, and the whole front of his smock-frock and gaiters was covered with a dancing shadow-pattern of thorn twigs, the light reaching him through a leafless intervening hedge, and the metallic curve of his sheep-crook shone silver-bright in the same abounding rays. He came up to the boundary fence, and stood to regain breath. It seemed as if the spot was unoccupied by a living soul. The fire was issuing from a long straw-stack, which was so far gone as to preclude a possibility of saving it. A rick burns differently from a house. As the wind blows the fire inwards, the portion in flames completely disappears like melting sugar, and the outline is lost to the eye. However, a hay or wheat rick, well put together, will resist combustion for a length of time, if it begins on the outside. This, before Gabriel's eyes, was a rick of straw, loosely put together, and the flames darted into it with lightning swiftness. It glowed on the windward side, rising and falling in intensity, like the coal of a cigar. Then a superincumbent bundle rolled down with a whisking noise, flames elongated, and bent themselves about with a quiet roar, but no crackle. Banks of smoke went off horizontally at the back like passing clouds and behind these burned hidden pyres, illuminating the semi-transparent sheet of smoke to a lustrous yellow uniformity. Individual straws in the foreground were consumed in a creeping movement of ruddy heat, as if they were knots of red worms, and above shone imaginary fiery faces, tongues hanging from lips, glaring eyes, and other impish forms, from which at intervals sparks flew in clusters like birds from a nest. Oak suddenly ceased from being a mere spectator by discovering the case to be more serious than he had first imagined. A scroll of smoke blew aside and revealed to him a wheat rick in startling juxtaposition with a decaying one, and behind this a series of others composing the main corn produce of the farm, so that instead of the straw stack standing, as he had imagined, comparatively isolated, there was a regular connection between it and the remaining stacks of the group. Gabriel leapt over the hedge, and saw that he was not alone. The first man he came to was running about in a great hurry, as if his thoughts were several yards in advance of his body, which they could never drag on fast enough. "'Oh, man! Fire! Fire! A good master and a bad servant is fire! F fire! I mean, a bad servant and a good master! Oh, Mark Clark, come! And you, Billy Smallbury! And you, Mary Ann Money! And you, Jan Coggan! And Matthew there!' Other figures now appeared behind this shouting man and among the smoke, and Gabriel found that, far from being alone, he was in a great company, whose shadows danced merrily up and down, timed by the jigging of the flames, and not at all by their owner's movements. 
The assemblage, belonging to that class of society which casts its thoughts into the form of feeling, and its feelings into the form of commotion, set to work with a remarkable confusion of purpose. "'Stop the draught under the wheat rick!' cried Gabriel to those nearest to him. The corn stood on stone straddles, and between these tongues of yellow hue from the burning straw licked and darted playfully. If the fire once got under this stack all would be lost. "'Get a tarpaulin, quick!' said Gabriel. A rick-cloth was brought, and they hung it like a curtain across the channel. The flames immediately ceased to go under the bottom of the corn-stack, and stood up vertical. "'Stand here with a bucket of water, and keep the cloth wet,' said Gabriel again. The flames, now driven upward, began to attack the angles of the huge roof covering the wheat-stack. "'A ladder!' cried Gabriel. "'The ladder was against the straw-rick, and is burnt to a cinder,' said a spectre-like form in the smoke. Oak seized the cut-ends of the sheaves, as if he were going to engage in the operation of reed-drawing, and, digging in his feet, and occasionally sticking in the stem of his sheep-crook, he clambered up the beetling face. He at once sat astride the very apex, and began with his crook to beat off the fiery fragments which had lodged thereon, shouting to the others to get him a bow and a ladder, and some water. Billy Smallbury, one of the men who had been on the wagon, by this time had found a ladder which Mark Clark ascended, holding on beside Oak upon the thatch. The smoke at this corner was stifling, and Clark, a nimble fellow, having been handed a bucket of water, bathed Oak's face and sprinkled him generally, whilst Gabriel, now with a long beech bough in one hand, in addition to his crook in the other, kept sweeping the stack and dislodging all fiery particles. On the ground the groups of villagers were still occupied in doing all they could to keep down the conflagration, which was not much. They were all tinged orange, and backed up by shadows of varying pattern. Round the corner of the largest stack, out of the direct rays of the fire, stood a pony, bearing a young woman on its back. By her side was another woman, on foot. These two seemed to keep at a distance from the fire, that the horse might not become restive. "'He's a shepherd,' said the woman on foot. "'Yes, he is. See how his crook shines as he beats the rick with it? And his smock-frock is burnt in two holes, I declare.' "'A fine young shepherd he is, too, ma'am.' "'Whose shepherd is he?' said the equestrian, in a clear voice. "'I don't know, ma'am.' "'Don't any of the others know?' "'Nobody at all. I've asked them. Quite a stranger, they say.' The young woman on the pony rode out from the shade and looked anxiously around. "'Do you think the barn is safe?' she said. "'Do you think the barn is safe, Jan Coggan?' said the second woman, passing on the question to the nearest man in that direction. "'Safe now. Leastwise I think so. If this rick had gone, the barn would have followed. Tis that bold shepherd up there that have done the most good. He's sitting on top of that rick, whizzing his great long arms about like a windmill.' "'He does work hard,' said the young woman on horseback, looking up at Gabriel through her thick woollen veil. "'I wish he was shepherd here. Don't any of you know his name?' "'Never heard a man's name in my life, or seed his form afore.' The fire began to get worsted, and Gabriel's elevated position being no longer required of him, he made as if to descend. "'Mary Anne,' said the girl on horseback, "'go to him as he comes down, and say that the farmer wishes to thank him for the great service he has done.' Mary Anne stalked off towards the rick, and met Oak at the foot of the ladder. She delivered her message. "'Where, where is your master, the farmer?' said Gabriel, kindling with the idea of getting employment that seemed to strike him now. "'Tisn't a master, tis a mistress, shepherd. "'A woman farmer? "'Ah, I believe, and a rich one, too,' said a bystander. "'Lately you came here from a distance. "'Took on her uncle's farm who died suddenly, "'and used to measure his money in half-point cups. "'They say now that she business in every bank in Casterbridge, "'and thinks no more of playing pitch-and-toss sovereign "'than you and I do pitch halfpenny. "'Not a bit in the world, shepherd. "'That's she, back up there on the pony,' said Mary Anne, "'with her face a covered up in that black cloth with holes in it. "'Oak, his features smudged, grimy and undiscoverable from the smoke and heat, "'his smock-frock burnt into holes and dripping with water, "'the ash-stem of his sheep-crook, charred six inches shorter, "'advanced with the humility stern adversity had thrust upon him "'up to the slight female form in the saddle.' He lifted his hat with respect, and not without gallantry. Stepping close to her hanging feet, he said in a hesitating voice, 
Do you happen to want a shepherd, ma'am? She lifted the wool veil tied round her face and looked all astonishment. Gabriel and his cold-hearted darling Bathsheba Everdeen were face to face. Bathsheba did not speak, and he mechanically repeated in an abashed and sad voice, Do you want a shepherd, ma'am? End of chapter 6